Philip Martin, and this is on film uh, for uh, July 29th, 2022. Possibly the coolest summer of the rest of your life. Anyway, uh, you just saw a clip from Vengeance. Uh, Vengeance is a movie I saw at Tribeca. I didn't see it all, which is why I didn't review it. I meant to go and get a, um, a screener for it because I, as happens at these... Uh, film festivals, I walked into it late. I did not expect, I, I just wanted to catch a little bit of it and then go see the next film, which I had a, initially a, a bigger interest in. And I ended up staying and I really liked the film. I really liked it an awful lot. And I was going to review it myself, but um, things happened and Keith um, did the job, stepped in. He got, a, he got a screener for it. He saw it. What I liked about it and um, there's one scene in particular, and it's uh, about the Waterburger in Texas. And I had forgotten that people do this because a long time ago, 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, I lived in Texas for a while, and I lived Texas adjacent for a long time. I used to spend a lot of time in Texas. One of the things that Texans do is they steal the little uh, numbers from the Waterburger, where they, you know... Where you're number three and you're waiting for your order, I don't know why they take it. I mean, they, but people would have like dozens of these in their car, their house, or whatever because they would just take their order number uh, with them and um, it didn't recycle it or anything like that. I don't know exactly why they sort of explain it in in the movie. With you're supposed to take your lucky number, but some people just take them all because I guess all their numbers are lucky or they don't know what their lucky number is. But anyway. It was that sort of specific detail that really made me like the movie a lot because it indicated that uh, the writer, director, B.J. Star, B.J. Novak had actually, you know, been to Texas before and had actually observed this actual ritual, this thing that people actually do that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. It's sort of a behavioral non sequitur. But, you know, you put that in the movie and people who, like me, who remember that ritual and, and, and know people who did it and may have taken a number or two themselves, it brings you into the film in a way that uh, maybe you wouldn't be brought in the film otherwise. Um, <laughs> and I like what I like about it. It's, it's, I write about Letterkenny in my Sunday column. So Letterkenny and Shorzy, the um, the Canadian, I think they started on Crave TV, which is a subsidiary of Bell, uh, which is this huge media conglomerate in Canada. But they show they run on Hulu here. Uh, the two TV shows are Letterkenny and Shorzy. And having spent a little time in Canada, but being far from a Canadian and far from uh, someone who knows about. Uh, rural Canada and how people behave and the little things they do. It's really instructive to watch these things because you kind of know when something is real and when something is just made up by the writers. And most of the stuff in Letterkenny and Shorzy is very, very real. Vengeance reminds me of that in that it looks at the South, specifically it looks at Texas, and it looks at it in a way that most... Um, movies wouldn't it would most texas would be monolithic in most films and there's a reason why is because you know you the reason you would even can't put something in texas is so you could borrow from that texasness that we all understand that sort of macho um you know taciturn uh toughness of texas you know it's that's why you use texas and that's one of the reasons that Texas appears in this. But throughout the whole film, they spend, Novak spends the whole time, you know, subverting the idea of this Texasness. And it's got great little moments in it. I'm going to show you um, another clip from it later on with Ash and Kutcher. In fact, I'll probably just leave the, um, that for the end of the, of the, whatever this is, the video podcast, whatever we call this, uh, I'll leave that for the end of it because it's, um, it's a nice little moment. And it's, it's interesting that uh, this film is actually playing theatrically because this is a independent comedy. I would call it a dark comedy slash mystery. 
And it's exactly the sort of thing that is getting a lot of play, a lot of run on streaming services now. This is the sort of movie you would think would end up on a streaming service, especially in the middle of summer. I don't expect it will get a whole lot of like awards buzz, though there's some really nice performances. The aforementioned, well, B.J. Novak's really good in it, and I've never been, well, I'm a B.J. Novak uh, agnostic because I've never paid any attention to the U.S. office, and um, I've not really seen him on other things. I mean, I may be in a talk show here or there, and I've know that he's a writer and I've read a little bit of his you know stuff in the New Yorker or whatever uh, um, Boyd Holbrook is in it and Boyd Holbrook is one of my f- favorite under the radar actors right now and he has a nice little part as your typical Texan and that again gets subverted near the end uh, Issa Rae is in it uh, she plays a according to type, as this sort of uh, wised-up uh, podcast producer. Uh, Jay Cameron Smith is in it, and she's wonderful. And it's just really nicely cast, really nicely... I, the plot... The idea is that B.J. Novak is a writer for The New Yorker, which, okay, and he wants to get into podcasting. Like, okay... And he has this idea for a story that happens when the family of a girl that he once hooked up with, or hooked up with a couple times, calls him and tells him that she's dead and asks him to come to the funeral. And he gets there and he realizes there's this mystery surrounding her death, even though he didn't know her that well. And he's sort of pretending that he was a significant other to her. The family doesn't realize he wasn't. And he starts you know, uh, unwinding this death for selfish reasons to make a podcast of it, which really is a very um, interesting meta thing because in our business, you know, as as a writer, a writer, everything is material, so there's really nothing bad that can ever happen to you. I mean, you can always use what tragedy, you know, seeps into your life as um, fodder. And sometimes that's sort of ethically troubling. Like I try not to, I mean, I try not to, you know, when family members or people like that are sick, I try not to, you know, use that ongoing drama in my work. I mean, sometimes I guess I don't really hold to that all the time. I've written about things that have happened in my family, but I try not to exploit it. And the line between exploitation and actually doing, you know, some public good uh, by using it as an example, it's kind of hard to, to discern. Uh, last week I showed my um, Life Quest class, uh, Billy Wilder film from 1951, Ace in the Hole, which wasn't really well accepted at the time it was released. It was released as the big carnival. It really didn't even get anybody excited until around the the mid nineties, I think, when people started to rediscover this film. And it's it's a very interesting film, and it's very timely today. Uh, people in my class really reacted strongly to it. It's about a unscrupulous reporter who uses a mine accident. A, a guy gets trapped in a mine, and uh, Kirk Douglas. The, who's a wonderful performance, is a, is a really bad person. Uh, he uses that uh, tragedy to put himself back on the journalism map to uh, get a job with a New York paper, and he's, it, the, he's getting $1,000 a day to report on this, and he is he effectively keeps the guy trapped when he could have been rescued. And I don't. I guess I, I. I don't want to spoil a seventy-one-year-old film. All right. Seventy-one years old. Is that right? Can that be right? I guess it's right. Seventy-one years old. Seventy-one-year-old film. Um, by telling you what happens, but if you, you know, I mean, I guess you can imagine. It's. It's. Uh, but it is as much about our susceptibility to doing what we want and rationalizing it. <laughs> Which is what we do. This is what human beings do. I mean, sort of like you, 
know that if there was a spectacle like this, people would try to capitalize on it. They would make T-shirts. They would, you know, set up uh, concession stands, people waiting to see if this guy gets out of the mine or not. Um, and the podcast about, you know, I think it's Dead White Girls is the name of the podcast. It's, it's the same sort of thing. You are sort of, you know, capitalizing on human misfortune. And I wouldn't, you know, say anybody shouldn't do that. It's all in the touch and all in the manner you handle it and all in the sensitivity with which you... Because, I mean, we need to know these stories and we need to hear these stories. And these stories are the stuff of, 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 of drama and what makes us human. It's the way we build empathy. It's the... But there's a fine line. I mean, it's sort of like the whole murder is not uh, entertainment crowd. Well, yes, it is. Murder has always been entertainment. It's a height, heightened human experience. So, but anyway, it's <laughs> kind of funny that I can see a movie like Vengeance, and I can see in it both, you know, this sort of letterkenny compassion for people who... The audience is not normally required to have compassion for. In this case, you know, Texans, you know, <laughs> hard shell Texans. You know, we're, we we're normally we either react to them as you know, sort of strong, silent heroes, or you know, backwards. Um, <sighs> Red state people, okay? Uh, and this vengeance is not a great movie, and there's some stuff. I mean, at the end, everything sort of like kind of falls apart. But it is a movie that is, uh, it's got a heart, it's got some compassion to it, and it does not, you know, allow for these easy characterizations. And that's about all you can ask for a movie that's supposed to entertain you for, you know, 90 minutes, an hour, two hours, you know. Uh, it's, it's really nice. Now, the big movie of the week uh, is probably this one. So, you are a dog. I am the Batman. I'm not really great with animals. Yeah, I'm not really great with people. Probably because of my traumatic puppyhood. As a child, my family was taken from me. As a puppy, I was taken from my family. So I steal myself. My emotions always in check. No one ever getting past my impenetrable defenses. Ah, what the heck? <laughs> that can't be sanitary. Every day, me and Suits hang out. You literally worship the ground that dude walks on. Technically, he flies. Batman works alone, except for Robin and Alfred, Commissioner Gordon, my IT crew, whoever Morgan Freeman played. What do I have here? <gasps> Squeezy Bruce! Squeezy what? That better be a licensed toy or I will freak out. Okay. Um, I like Keanu Reeves as Batman, I have to say. Mm. But, you know, it's sort of like, yeah, it's, it's end of summer. Not end of summer, really. I mean, we've got two more months of this, but, you know, we're sort of um, into that <laughs> iffy kind of thing. Um, I don't know. I mean, it may be great. Uh, Courtney? Lanning, who um, is pretty much our animation person, <laughs> liked it, and uh, I would hope that, um, you know, well, anyway, you're going to see that or you're not going to see that, so we'll just leave it at that. Um, <laughs> I really don't have anything against these things. I just don't know what to say about uh, 
the Legion of Super Pets. You know, I mean, it's sort of kind of an obvious thing and kind of like I'm sure it's been done before. Um, I, 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 re- I really would like it to be a live action thing. <laughs> and not with uh, real dogs, but it with like uh, Dwayne Johnson and uh, Kevin Hart playing dogs, only, you know, and <laughs> Putting on dog costumes. That would be the way I would like to see this play out. Uh, this sort of debacle kind of, you know, sort of a cats-like debacle. That, that would be the way to go with this movie as far as I'm concerned. But bless you guys. I mean, it's like Warner Brothers, go, good on you. I mean, uh, everybody needs crypto, a little crypto in their lives, I think. Um, yeah, cryptocurrency. That would... That might be the headline. That might be the headline. I might have just thought it up right now. Uh, I'm going to make a note of that and send it over to the design desk, and they're going to shoot me down. But <laughs> Writing headline. It's, it's, it's funny because it's sort of like every week. Um, it's not exactly horses for courses with the way reviews are assigned. Uh, a lot of the reviews are signed just basically on who can get there, who can see them, who can see the film, uh, because we do have conflicts. We have everybody who writes reviews does other stuff too. Um, I don't have perfect control over the schedule. don't have any control over the schedule, to be honest. I mean, some of these things we, we, we get screeners for and we can watch them uh, at our leisure, but often, you know, big movies, relatively big movies like Legion of Super Pets, you go to the theater to see them. I don't know if Courtney went to the theater to see this or not. I think she did. Um, but anyway, uh, we do tend to have, you know, Courtney review our animated films, and I think she does a great job, and she's very enthusiastic about it, and she's probably exactly the person who should do it, because you don't want somebody who doesn't like movies writing about the movies, though that happens all the time. It used to happen a lot more often when newspapers actually gave people the chance to write about movies. Now, if you're writing about movies, you're probably doing it because you've decided to. See? And so if you've decided to write about it, you probably didn't decide to write about it because you hate movies. But there were critics back in the day who honestly, I don't know why they were doing the job except that they got their paycheck that way. I mean... People who didn't like movies or writing about movies. So the first rule is that you have to be open to be charmed by a motion picture. If that sort of thing does not work on you, and that's fine, I guess. I mean, just because you don't like the movies doesn't mean that you're a bad person, I don't suppose. But... You're not going to write for me. <laughs> anyway, um, that's about all I want to do this week. I don't want to, want to, to, to drag this out just to drag it out. I will say that in the future, within a couple of weeks, I hope we're going to be making some changes uh, with our section. The main thing is going to – well, not maybe not the main thing. The, there, there's a sort of something I can't talk about yet that may be happening. But one thing that probably is – pretty sure I'm going to have is I'm probably going to change the nature of my column and I'm going to try to write it more regularly because it's the first thing out every week when we don't have we don't when we don't have room which is often we don't have room we have just about every week we have stuff that's held over till the next week in fact I know there's stuff well I just finished editing the section so I know I know there's at least one piece that's not going to make it into this week's um issue. So I'm going to try to make my column a little bit different and maybe a little bit better or a little bit uh, more, um, I don't know, more um, more of service, let's say that. And we will, we're will. we working on that. And we're working on a few other things and uh, we'll see you on the other side. So I'm going to leave you uh, with this nice little interlude with uh, B.J. Novak and uh, Ashton Kutcher. Okay, thanks.